Welcome viewers. Our guest today is Mr. Pat Ferris, founder of Blizzard Bike Club and a well-known cyclist of our Peace region. Thank you, Pat, for coming to our program. Oh, glad to be here. Great. So first of all, please tell us a little more about yourself. I moved here for six months from Victoria in 1975 and never left, is a familiar uh, phrase, I guess, around here. Uh, found it to be a great place, great people. I came here originally to work for uh, became uh, Spectra eventually in the oil and gas industry and I worked there for 25 years then started a bike shop and then recently retired and now I'm back to what my passion lately is writing books. Great, thank you. And cycle racing has a long history since 1868. How do you view European Grand Tours as compared to USA Cycling? US Cycling has come a long way over the years. Of course the Grand Tours are the, the ultimate. The Tour de France has more people actively standing on the side of the road watching the race than possibly all the, the Stanley Cup uh, events put together. I mean, it's, it's a massive undertaking. It's hugely popular. The riders that go to the Tour de France are the picked riders of the world. So they're like the all-star teams. Whereas the American cycling tends to be more a feeder to it. Uh, generally speaking, the the amateurs of cycling will, will ride their bikes, they'll get better, they may become national champions at some point or, or do well. Then they'll end up in the, possibly in the States doing some semi-pro teams and they'll work their way up through the ranks. It's not unlike hockey that way. So eventually when you get to be a professional cyclist with, in the Tour de France, you may be on a big team and then part of your team may get chosen to ride the Tour de France. So it is a feeder. There's the Tour of California, which is very popular. It's a big race. Uh, but generally speaking, any of the Grand Tours, the Tour de France being the ultimate, that's what you're looking for. Thank you. And what developments have occurred in our Cycling Canada in the last few years? Cycling's come a long way in Canada and it's become a lot more popular as far as uh, uh, the riders tend to be uh, in a better coaching system. Provincially they tend to be looked after better. Uh, way back 30 years ago it was very unusual to see a Canadian professional cycling even in the American system. Whereas now there's probably more than there's ever been. So it, it really has done well. And I think it's partly because people can see a, a goal, a place to go. They can, they can know they're riding in their town and they know that to get better, they need to go to a bigger city and get within a, like a red truck team or one of those teams. They have like, uh, uh, they'll start riding with those and they'll start, they'll be looked upon and do well in the bigger races. They'd be like Mount Hood or something like that. And as they're doing better, they'll start being looked at by the bigger teams They may have scouts out watching for them and eventually they'll work their way into the, the bigger team. So it has come a long way. And something too that I think has happened is the whole paracycling, like the Paralympics were amazing this year for the, the number of uh, quality riders that are coming out of Canada as well. And a lot of those riders, coaches, are guys that have been around cycling for a long time. So they're becoming uh, smarter, more more experienced and bringing these people along, which is all very, very good. Good. And your club started in 1982 in Fort St. John, and then it has trained and produced national champions. What encouraged you to start the club? Well, I cycled a lot in Victoria. It was pretty intense, and, and I moved to Fort St. John. And there was, wasn't any club at that time, so I wasn't sure if there was even an option, but there's a fellow from Victoria that moved up here, and he's kind of a mutual friends, and, and he said, well, come on out and cycle with us because this is, this is a lot of fun. And we have roads, we have no traffic to speak of compared to Victoria or Vancouver. So he said, come on out and try it. So, so we come out, we started riding together and then a few people wanted to join. And then we thought, well, let's start a legit club. And, and slowly it worked its way up. Uh, we've had uh, quite a few good riders that have gone on to, to be national champions uh, from us, like the Woods boys, of course, and Dr. Wood himself has got a medal from the nationals too. So yeah, we're, we're doing well with cycling. Great. And what are the major activities organized by the club? Generally speaking, we're one of the original uh, people that started the Fort St. John Triathlon. Uh, we have mostly road races, so it's what you see on television, like the Tour de France kind of thing. We do off-roading, like mountain biking, and we do what's called a cyclocross, which is like a combination on-road and off-road. So we do all those range of things. And then uh, some, we did a charity event, Dan, helped Dan Webster with his, he put on that the ride they had in the, uh, the junior diabetes ride and that instantly is the first ride in Canada that's been put on by the 
for the diabetes group. Normally it's indoor, they've never had something actually outdoors. So that's the first one in Canada that they've had like that. So yeah, it's, it's gone very well. Great. And uh, about yourself, you have won many recognitions. Please tell us some of your best memories. Cycling's a lot of fun. It's, it's, you always get a good workout, uh, kind of keeps us out of trouble. And probably the, the highlight would be when the club, bike club had our 30th anniversary, because you know, we started a club and we're, we're the, probably the tiniest town with the biggest club anywhere. So it's never quite sure if, if it's gonna go year to year, but eventually we had a 30th anniversary, which is pretty cool. We've always seemed to manage between 50 and 100 riders, which is always interesting keeping our numbers up. And in 1986, we actually sent a team to Ireland, to the Ross Talton. And we're the, for a long time, we were the only team from Canada. And this is just a, an amateur team from Blizzard Bike Club. We're the only amateur team to go to that race and ride in. It was 900 miles in nine days. And it was hilly and rainy, and, but it was a lot of fun. But yeah, that was very cool. It's a lot of good memories. It was been a lot of fun riding with my kids. Like we'll go to a race in, in uh, Vancouver or Alberta kind of thing and both my boys are racing and my wife is officiating and I'm there riding too and yeah, it's nothing like it. You should try it. Absolutely. Great. And uh, also you have written two books, Gypsies and Gypsy Engagement. So what inspired you to write these books? Well, it was kind of a long-term thing. It was a, a friend of mine was a writer and I thought, well, I wonder if I could do that. And I thought, how hard could it be? And it was really hard. It took a long time. It took me years and years. So eventually I wrote the first one and then finished that one. And I thought, well, because it's 100,000 words, it's a lot of work. And the second book I did, well, I hadn't planned to do a second one. And pretty soon people come up and says, well, you told us about the story of the gypsies. So is Larry and Giselle. So what happens next? So I hadn't really thought about it. So I'll get pestered to write the second one. So the second one came out. And after the second one, people are after me to do the, a third one. So I'm about halfway through the a third book. Uh, I've written uh, one book or one story, actually it's a novella about half the size of a, a regular novel that's going in our Peace Talks, which is our peace anthology book that's coming out in around Christmas time. And I'm just finishing off a dystopian novel uh, about if Trump wins the election in the States, what would the States look like in 30 years? So far, the reviews are good. We're going to do some editing on that, but yeah, we're, we're moving along. Thank you. And how do gypsies enjoy their freedom? It's, it's an odd story. It's about a, a lady that came from, she was, things weren't going well in her home country, so she came to Canada. This is the usual story. I mean, my folks came from Ireland way back when and came to the States to go to school because it's always, you know, the characters go to school and you'll, make this big bucks and all this stuff. Well, she got and she finds she's turned away with the politics of the time in the, in the States. So she ended up kind of picking up a job along the way. Uh, then she met the Canadian boys and romance blossomed and kind of followed along with it in the, in the racing and, and, the, and her boyfriend is the one he's trying to make it to ride the Tour de France someday. And that's part of following this from going from a, a, a really good national rider to becoming a eventually a professional. So that's kind of where the stories go. It's kind of a literary soap opera. Great, thank you. And coming back to our sports, Fort St. John's athletes, they have won six Olympic golds, five Olympic silvers, and one Olympic bronze. So please tell us a little more about these accomplishments. Well, that's, that's just amazing. Like, uh, uh, we, we did a, my son and I set up a, a, a Facebook page called Fort St. John Rules, R-U-L-E-S. And we thought, there, there's, because you always hear the stories, like there's the, there's this dog sledders, the Saundersons that are world champions. And we know there's one lady in the bike club, for example, she's the, her and her partner are the world trans alp champions. So, well, there's got to be a few of those people out there. So we'll start this little page up, you know, a few things will pop in and see how it goes. But as it's been coming in, we found more and more information about all these people from Fort St. John that have done all these things. Of course, everybody's heard of Danny Morrison, uh, Ina Bush is another one that's done well. Bo Hedges is, was just came back from the, the Rio Olympics. For some reason, there's something in the water that, I mean, we've got a, a, a record that most big cities would be quite impressed with. And it's just one of many. It's extraordinary. Like, uh, we've had people, for example, in Lord of the Dance. There's been half a dozen Fort St. John girls in the Lord of the Dance 
with Michael Flatley for years. We've had uh, gold medalists in the World Science Fair. There, there's a whole bunch of things that happen here. It seems to me we've got the two groups of people. We've got the people that want to be here and are, are on it and do these things, and folks that are here kind of under protest. But the, the people that are here and like it here go on to do amazing things. And is the peace region a perfect place, having the perfect environment for many sports? It can. I mean, every place has this plus and minus. If you're living in the big city, you've got a lot more competition, you're closer to competition, but then there's more, it's more expensive to do. You might have to travel all the way across town in traffic to get to your training venue. There are some coaches, but it, it, it can be harder. It's kind of a two-edged sword. Whereas Fort St. John, we've got, I know in, in cycling, for example, we've got wide open roads with very little traffic. The motorists are very good. Uh, speed skating oval, we have one of only two active speed skating ovals in Canada. That's, that's an amazing venue. Hockey, of course, we've got hockey uh, rinks and hockey people, but they've got to travel too. So, I mean, you're never going to have everything, but certainly the, the attitude of the people and the dedication makes all the difference. Thank you. And Pomeroy Sports Centre has boosted sports activities in Fort St. John. What other developments can help our athletes? Uh, the Pomeroy has, has been, there's a whole bunch of things operated out of there. There's, uh, because there's only two of them, Calgary's is looked, on, looked after by the university, whereas uh, Fort St. John's actually municipally run. It's one of the only ones like that. And they do have the, the speed skating oval, which means it's also a public oval. Normally, public skating, you kind of have to wait for times to get on and off the, between the hockey teams on the hockey ice. But this, it's a big oval. All ages can skate at, at wide, you know, a wide range of times. The walking track, you go up there at any given time and there's a lot of people, some people shut-ins, for example, or older people not interested in, in breaking their leg and slipping on the ice or something. And it's a very busy place. It's a very active one. And you may look down at the two hockey rinks when you're up there walking around and you see the, the figure skaters on one ice and the hockey players on the other. And at the same time, there's the kids from the Energetic Campus School down in the uh, sections down below shooting baskets and playing basketball. So, I mean, it's, it's quite a, an amazing community center. And then, of course, they have the, uh, uh, they had the archery the nationals here a couple years ago, fit in as well. Uh, the trade show. Yeah, it, it's a, quite an extraordinary uh, thing to have in Fort St. John. I know when it first came, when they said they were going to build us, I thought, oh, yeah, but that'll, it's nothing happens like that for us. It, our money goes out and it gets built something somewhere, but to actually have something cool here for us is fabulous. Great. And at a global level, over 11,000 athletes from 207 countries, they participated in Rio Olympics. The motto of these Olympics was a new world. How can all of us build a new beautiful world? Well, that's, that's always a tough one, like how to make a, a better world. Basically, uh, sports is very good because you have these dedicated people that, like the Danny Morrisons, basically has lived speed skating for, for all of these years, despite the, the pitfalls that come along. And plus, there's been, well, seven actually speed skaters from Fort St. John have made the national team at some point or another. I mean, to see this dedication of these people is just extraordinary. And I mean, I think it makes us all maybe, you know, at least support them or aspire to be like them. Uh, kids are watching TV and seeing these athletes and saying, you know, I, I could do that. Maybe, maybe I should try. You know, and, and the fact that they try is, is builds their attitude and their, and their fitness and keeps people doing something that they really want to do. You know, it's aiming for your dream. A dream is always hard to find. But when you find it, it's wonderful, and you you got to go after it. You just can't not go after your dream. Usain Bolt proved to be the fastest human ever in these Olympics. So please comment on his famous quote, don't think about the start of a race, think about the ending. Well, he's extraordinary. There's a Canadian got a bronze in that race too, I'll point out. But Usain Bolt is extraordinary. I mean, there's a little tiny t uh, island in the middle of nowhere, I don't just say call it that, but a very tiny island that supposedly they have, don't have the, the money of the, of the states, for example. They don't have the, the numbers of, say, like a place like China, but they have these extraordinary track people. So, I mean, these people are, uh, they're, they're on it. They're uh, definitely looking for the talent. The people that they have are training very hard. 
And yeah, to come up with something like that is, is extraordinary. I don't know about that the finish line is the key, because of course in 100 meter you don't have a lot, probably long to think about it. But to me, it's more, for most of these athletes, it's more about the journey to the top. Like when you climb the mountain, if, if, if you could just simply be dropped by a helicopter on the top of the mountain and stand there, you can say, well, I made it to the top, that must be all there is to it. But to me, it's the journey, like all the way you're toiling up there, you're finding yourself, you're, you're meeting people, you learn, uh, you, you learn your craft, your technique, and you're clawing your way up and you might not make it. But ultimately, when you get up to the top, you appreciate it way more than if you were just dropped there. So you really have to be, to want it, to, to climb your way to the top. And that's, that's the only way you get satisfaction. And Pat, thank you for bringing your bike. I'm sure you have many good memories. Please tell us a little more about your bike. Uh, this bike is more of a road style machine. It's handmade Italian, so it's very light, very nice. You, you don't need a bike uh, necessarily at this quality. I mean, you can have, have fun on any kind of bike that you own. Uh, typically, the more you spend on a bike, they tend to be better quality, better adjusted. Uh, they'll last longer, more reliability, but everybody has your favorite bike. Doesn't matter where it came from, as long as you're happy with it. Now, this is a road style machine, meaning it's got the drop bars, it's quite light, it's got the small wheels. Its intent is more to ride on the on road, so it's pavement of pretty much any kind. We can endure quite a bit, actually. People would be surprised. This is opposed to, say, a mountain bike where they'll have like a flat bar, the bigger heavy tires for more off-roading kind of thing. There's, there's a whole variety of bikes out there, but this is typical of what a top-end uh, road bicycle will look like. And how can we encourage people towards biking? You know, a healthy lifestyle? Uh, best thing is, if you, everybody pretty well has a bike sitting in their basement, just pump the tires up, put some oil on the chain, and make sure the brakes work, and go out for a bike ride. You'll notice around Fort St. John, there's probably 25 uh, paved trails. They're, they're cycling and walking type trails. They're wide, they're paved, they're, they're excellent. So you can ride around town if you're not all that wild about riding in traffic. You don't have to worry about the traffic, you just ride on those trails. If you're an on-road guy, you want to go check out the, uh, like the rural roads, five minutes and you're out basically on a rural road and out you go towards Montney or Cease Lake, wherever you want to go. Uh, do note this is a very hilly country. Everybody in the south kind of comes up here and they go, oh yeah, that's pretty, pretty flat up there. No, it's so, we're surrounded with, with valleys. And I know the Grand Prairie guys, when they come over in the uh, Dawson Creek guys, they're always amazed at how hilly it is for our races, but that's part of its charm. And finally, Pat, what does sportsman spirit mean to you? To me, it's, it's having fun. Uh, it's the camaraderie, camaraderie of the group, learning something, uh, trying to climb to the top of what your sport is and meeting the people along the way. I mean, regardless how far you get in the climb, you'll always remember the people that you went along with. It. You'll always have the memories. You'll always be sitting around talking the stories, the one that got away, you know, the, the, the fish that jumped off just before he got its net around it. But that's what sports are all about. And the more people that do sports, I think the, the better the world is. So we have to keep up the motivation. Yes, exactly. Absolutely. And uh, thank you very much, sir. Thank you for coming to our program, and we wish you all the best. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thanks for having me.